Good morning, TOK. Welcome to class number 10. What do you know? Today, as we continue a little practical application, a little dive into theory of knowledge, we're going to talk about justification. This is something we'll revisit more deeply again in a later lesson, but uh, I think it's important for us to get an idea. If we're going to define knowledge as justified true belief, a definition that we used earlier, I think it's important that we talk about justification. When you're presented with multiple possibilities, how do you determine which one or ones are true? Can there be more than one truth? If there is more than one truth, how do you pick amongst them? How do you justify? How do you present a believability, a confidence, a certainty among competing truths? Uh, for this type of lesson, I like to use poetry because it is very easy to find poems which contain more than one truth. So that's what we're going to do next. So I hope you'll forgive the, the casual nature of uh, my presentation today. Um, I live in a small apartment, and I've lived here since last January, and so far I have not turned on the heat one, one time. Uh, I do have a little space heater, one of those little fake fireplaces with the crackling flame illusion, and uh, it's cool this evening. I, I haven't been feeling particularly well this week, so I decided to sit in front of my fire and to think about T.O.K. and about truth, and to share a little poetry with y'all. Um, I hope you'll forgive the, uh, the departure from our normal studio or our, our guest studio where I recorded earlier this week. <sighs> Pressing on. One of the things, as not only a T.O.K. instructor, but as a, an English teacher, a... Uh, a human being, a artist, a, a poet, myself, one of the things that I love about poetry is that when it's really effective, poetry doesn't work on one level, it doesn't work on two levels, it works on three or more levels, and it works on all of them simultaneously. So three readers with different backgrounds, different grasps of language, different personal experiences, or just different ways of seeing the world, can come to the same poem and take very different truths away from that poem. Uh, I'm going to share two poems with you today. Uh, the first is uh, one of my favorite poets. Um, okay, I always say that such and such is my favorite, but I gotta say, William Blake was the man, okay? Uh, if you don't know the story of William Blake, he was a, a artist, um, and, and not, just a, not just like a painter. He was a, uh, an illustrator. He created acid etch uh, printing. He created uh, some really radical uh, technologies for printing, and... He was also a absolutely first-rate wordsmith. Uh, he lived in an exciting time, um, which is not as not always as some of us living today know a good thing. Um, there's a, a a famous truism. Uh, truism is a statement that's taken to be true, whether it's true or not. Um, that it's a Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. Um, Blake definitely lived in interesting times. Uh, he saw the revolution in, in Britain, the, um, the replacement of the monarchy with a, a Puritan government, um, which was tough for Blake because he was a radical free thinker. Um, there's a lot of evidence that he pursued ideas of 
of free will and free love, uh, which is always dangerous in a conservative and repressive time. Um, plus, he was just a genius with his words. Um, if you know any of Blake's work, you probably know a tiger. Um, tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. Uh, that, that's one of his. But we're going to look at The Sick Rose. What I want you to pay attention to on this poem is your first impressions, and then as I guide you through some possible different interpretations, I want you to see how your impressions or thoughts about the poem and the poet may change. So here we have The Sick Rose by William Blake. It's just two stanzas, eight lines. Uh, it has a very straightforward rhyme scheme. Um, and I think you'll find that on a first reading, on a purely literal level, what do the words actually say? Um, that it's understandable. O oh Rose, thou art sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy, and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. I just love the pacing, the rhythm, the sound. Um, I, I am a English native speaker. That's my, my first language. Um, and I find that compared to uh, Italian and French, which, uh, which I've studied, um, which have far more lyrical quality, a far more musical quality. Um, in Italian, for example, the vast majority of words end in vowels, making it very easy to rhyme uh, and, and accounting for the complex rhyme schemes of, for example, the Italian sonnet. I find that Blake's language is very straightforward. O oh, rose, thou art sick. Thou art, you are. The, the speaker says to the rose that the rose is sick. And why is it sick? Well, the invisible worm that flies in the night. Um, on a literal level, some kind of little bug, little critter has gotten, has, has flown into the flower bed, has gotten into the roses, has found out thy bed of crimson joy, crimson being that rich, bright red color, uh, evocative of, of blood or passion. But we're sticking to the literal level here. So the little worms have gotten into the roses in the flower bed. And his dark secret love does thy life destroy. Um, the worm in, in burrowing into the flowers is, is killing them. If someone were to say, Blake has written a poem about how his rose bushes are being destroyed by bugs. That's supported. It is a truth. It's very difficult to point to a line or phrase or image in this poem and not say, yeah, it, it, could, be, uh, it, it could be about flowers and bugs. We've already said, I think that Blake is a genius. And one of the reasons I think he's a genius is because the poem opens itself up to deeper, more interesting interpretations. If we look beyond the literal and into the metaphorical, where we use symbolism, where we use poetic comparison, I think you'll find a deeper, richer reading of the sick rose. We're going to do that next. Okay, so let's take a, a metaphorical or a more interpretive approach. O oh, Rose, thou art sick. Um, rose has been, uh, for many, many uh, generations, one of the most popular English names for girls. Um, so it is entirely possible through the association of flowers with, with love or beauty, that the rose here represents a woman. Rose, thou art sick. Something's wrong with my woman. The invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm. 
Okay. We're grown-ups, so we're going to approach this in a mature fashion. Um, at the same time, uh, this is being recorded, it's being uh, transmitted over the internet, and it's being delivered to school students, and I really like my job. So I'm going to be very careful with some of my verbiage here, and I'm going to require you to... Uh, well, I'm not going to draw pictures, okay? One of the reasons his woman could be ill is that an invisible worm, invisible because it's in darkness, it flies in the night. The night worm has gotten into his woman and made her sick. Um, yeah. And it's not just, it's not just in the night. It's in the howling storm. Howling, uh, animalistic, passionate, vibrant. It's uh, madness and, and, and lust and passion. Uh, it, this is not just, hey, it was a windy day. In the howling storm. And what has this invisible worm done to my woman? Well, says the speaker, it has found her bed of crimson joy. Her her bed of where she's having her joy and her dark secret love has destroyed her life. One possible, possible metaphorical interpretation of the sick rose goes, uh, to paraphrase one of my former students, Oh, Miss C, that woman caught a dose. Um, yes, it is possible. Remember, this was in a time when people were, as people have been throughout all history, sexually active and sometimes unfaithful to their partners. Um, this was also a time in which a new disease from the New World was spreading throughout Europe, a disease for which there was no effective treatment or cure at this time. Uh, that disease was called syphilis, um, or as the British called it, the French disease, or as the French called it, the British disease which I think tells you a lot about what you need to know about the relationships between France and Britain. Uh, there was trouble long before Brexit. Um, something has gotten to his woman. She is sick and her life is being destroyed. A possible metaphorical interpretation is the speaker here is complaining about how his unfaithful woman has contracted a disease which is destroying her health and her life. Ew. But at the same time, pretty relatable to a modern audience. Um, you know, uh, 300 years later, we can, we can kind of get behind this and say, yeah, yep. I see what you did there, William Blake. See what you did there. So, if The Sick Rose worked only on these two levels, uh, it's a poem about a guy with a flower uh, whose rose bushes aren't, aren't, aren't thriving, or it's a guy with an unfaithful woman who is sick um, because of her infidelity. That would be a, a, an effective poem. It would be strong, interesting, powerful. Um, it would be compelling uh, on some levels. But beyond the literal and the metaphorical, there's yet a more abstract layer, the, uh, the allegorical. An allegory is a work in which the entire, the entire work symbolically is representative of something else. Um, so if we take the lines not just for the symbols that they represent, but for what the whole, the whole poem as a gestalt, as a, as a single uh, framework of thinking, uh, what that represents, you can get a deeper dive. And as so many of these really cool, to me, uh, really cool interpretations of, uh, of works go, this one comes from a former student um, who, upon reading The Sick Rose, looked and said, well, the rose isn't a woman. That's too easy. 
that's just as easy as the rose is a flower. I said, okay, well then what is the rose? He said, well, look at the whole thing. So again, at this higher symbolic level. Rose, thou art sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm. The rose is a symbol of love. It represents the relationship of the speaker to his love. So the rose isn't just the lover, it is the love itself. It is the relationship. And why is the relationship sick? The invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm, that, that reeks of worms are destructive and secret. And he uses the, the word secret in the second stanza. Out of sight, out below the surface, a worm has inched its way in to this relationship. Something has crept into the love and is destroying it with howling madness from the inside. The invisible worm is a worm in the mind, in the brain. It is the insane, paranoid thought. The woman, the woman isn't faithful. The love is bad. It's going to end badly. Um, he's not worthy, or she's not worthy, or... Or, or it's going to end badly, has found thy bed of crimson joy, the bed they, that he shared with his love, where the relationship was expressed, is being destroyed by the dark secret love of the worm. Having thought that his partner might be unfaithful, he can't get the thought out of his head. And it's the paranoid thought that is poisoning that is destroying the life of the rose, his love. This is a story of a man descending into madness from jealousy and doubt, and it's destroying his relationship. Damn. I mean, legitimately, damn. <sighs> So we have three possible levels of interpretation here. There are more. Uh, there are other ways to read this poem. These are three that I think are well supported by the text. You can point to individual lines, images, or symbols and say, here's why I think this. In this particular case, I think that it's not that, oh, this is what the poem really means. I think the sick rose is great because all of these levels are true. That Blake has written a poem that if you want to read it as the story of a guy who can't grow his roses, it absolutely works in that way. And if you want to read it as a story of a man with an unfaithful woman who is reaping uh, the, 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 the terrible uh, harvest of her infidelity, yeah, it works that way too. And if you want to see it as the psychological torture uh, of a man descending into madness as his relationship is torn apart by his own doubt, his own insecurities. Yeah, it works that way too. I hope you've enjoyed The Sick Rose. Now let's move on to another uh, wonderful poem by William Butler Yeats called Where My Books Go. So here we have Yeats, a, a much more modern writer, um, writing considerably later than, than, uh, than Blake. And well, let's just dive in. Where my books go. All the words that I utter and all the words that I write must spread out their wings untiring and never rest in their flight till they come where your sad, sad heart is and sing to you in the night, beyond where the waters are moving, storm darkened or starry bright. Just like the sick rose, uh, this is eight lines here in one stanza. Uh, it is one sentence and really composes a, a complex series of images around one central idea. 
And just as we did with the sick rose, uh, let's break it down first in a, in a literal sense. Uh, where my books go from the title, um, we're answering a question. Where do my books go? All the words that I utter, utter means to speak, and all the words that I write. So when he says where my books go, he literally means the things he's composing, the things he's writing. They spread out their wings, untiring, and never rest in their flight. So the books fly away. Uh, and where do they go? Till they come where your sad, sad heart is and sing to you in the night. So they fly off to uh, the, uh, the person to whom the speaker is speaking, um, the, the person being addressed. Um, there is a presumption in a poem like this that that is the speaker's love. They, they come where your sad, sad heart is and sing to you in the night beyond where the waters are moving, storm darkened or starry bright. Uh, they go a great distance far away. Uh, we know this because they're untiring, they don't rest, uh, and they're far across the water. A literal reading of where my books go creates a, a kind of image of, of books spreading open uh, as though the pages were, were wings and flying off to sing to someone far away. Now, here's where the story gets good. Um, for many years, I thought this poem worked on, on two levels. It worked on the literal level of the books flying off to, to sing to someone far away. Um, and it worked on, a, on a, a more poetic, metaphorical level, all the words that I utter, all the words that I write. So everything I'm thinking and feeling has to go a great distance. Untiring wings, never rest. Um, and it comes to your sad, sad heart. I, you're sad, far away, we're separated. Um, maybe we're across the ocean. Uh, maybe you have sailed to the new world and left me behind. Maybe I have had to leave to pursue my, my writing and you have had to stay home. But my, my words will come to you and be a constant comfort. Um, we have the, the moving waters represents the great distance, the great separation. And the storm darkened and starry bright, day or, uh, day or night, rain or shine, I, I've got these words for you. And then one of my students, a, a very quiet man named, named Todd, one of, one of my very early uh, students in my career. Todd looked at me and said, you know, Mr. Caffiero, you're doing this poem wrong. Now, Todd was not someone to, to argue in class, certainly not to argue with the teacher in class. And being a good teacher, even in my early years, I did the right thing. I told him, Todd, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I need you to go to the back of the class and shut your mouth and just sit quietly. No, no, no. no. I, 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 I did what I hope is the right thing and what I would encourage any of you to do in a similar situation. I said, really? I've got it wrong? Tell me, what am I getting wrong? What am I missing? Uh, I'd love to know what this poem is, is really about. I wanted Todd to share his truth, his belief in the, the deeper meaning, the more allegorical meaning of where my books go. And what he said knocked my socks off as a teacher, as a, a student, as a learner, um, and, and, and as a poet, as somebody crafting my own work, I, I realized the kind of depth that's accessible through eight lines of verse. Let me share with you Todd's interpretation of where my books go. Okay, so right now I really want to cry. Um, I recorded the response um, with Todd's interpretation, and I, I spoke at some length about about what it means. I, I'm not using a script. I'm I'm narrating this from my own my own um, uh, emotional response. And there was an audio problem, and I've got none of that speech. 
So let's try again. First, here's Todd's interpretation. All the words that I utter and all the words that I write, everything that I hope and feel, all of my thoughts, all of my emotions, come pouring out of me in an uncontrollable torrent. And they spread out their wings. They must spread out their wings. I have no choice but to send all of these thoughts flying far, far away till they come where your sad, sad heart is. Sad, sad. Yeats doesn't use sad, sad because it's, uh, he couldn't think of a better term. It's a literary device. It's called an epizuxis. It's my favorite literary device. And yes, I am a colossal nerd because I have a favorite literary device. And it is this, the epizuxis. Say it. It's fun. Out loud. Epizuxis. It makes your mouth do a funny thing when you say it. An epizuxis is a repetition of a word or short phrase for emphasis. Sad, sad heart. No misunderstanding. It's not melancholy. It's not, uh, it's not depressed. It's not down. It's not heartbroken. It's sad, sad. The profundity, the, the colossa, the punch, punch on the arm where your sad, sad heart is, and they and sing to you in the night. It's always night. It's always darkness when the words find the person to whom they are directed. Beyond where the waters are moving, these are not the moving waters of an ocean or a sea. Moving water is a river. And symbolically, rivers separate worlds in poems. Uh... In Greek mythology, for example, the river Styx separates the land of the living from the land of the dead. And that's what Yeats is doing here, argued Todd. Mr. C, the reason that the words must fly off to this person and yet always find them in darkness is that they are not separated by distance, but by death. It is a permanent separation. And the heartbreak is in the poet, in the speaker, not in the audience, not in the, the person receiving the words. And when they come across that river that separates the two lands, they find the sad, sad heart in a night that is storm-darkened or starry bright. You're dead. You're gone, and I can no longer comfort you. I can no longer make I can no longer promise everything's going to be okay. Because you have passed beyond that river, passed beyond the veil that separates the life from death. And I don't the, the terrifying part is I don't know storm darkened or starry bright. I don't know if you're in a bad place or a good place. Since I can't hear back from you, I can only, only pour out all of my love, all of my thoughts, all of my dreams and hopes and feelings, all of my comfort, that it might bring you some small measure of peace in the darkness where you are now, and from which I can receive no response. I encountered this poem when I was in high school. I decided to use it in my teaching, my first or second year teaching. Um, every day that I have thought of this poem since Todd and I had that discussion, every day that I have looked at these words, I have lived that interpretation all the words that I utter and all the words that I write must spread out their wings untiring and never rest in their flight till they come where your sad, sad heart is and sing to you in the night beyond where the waters are moving, storm darkened or starry bright. 
the the justification that I use for saying that of all the truths of this poem, this for me is my truth. This is what this poem means to me. And I know that. I know it with certainty because it was like ringing a bell and that bell can never be unrung. Once I heard that interpretation, I've never been able to look at the words the same way. I've never been able to look at this and not say, yes, yes, that is what this means. That is what Yeats was thinking. That is what the words say. And that is how I feel every time I read. Um, I don't need the text in front of me. This is one of the dozen odd poems I can recite from memory. And... If you're looking for an example of emotion as a way of knowing, this is it. This is what it's like for a knower to justify their belief as true through the process of emotion. It feels so right. I cannot imagine, I cannot experience or recall another interpretation that has a greater degree of truth for me than this is a poem about a man separated from his love by death and desperately hoping that he can somehow influence their situation by pouring out all of his thoughts and feelings in words, in verse. This is a poet doing poetry for the reason we write poems, to use language to connect two hearts. <sighs> I'm sure that wasn't as good as the first take. Um, I hope that this helps you understand poetry. It helps you understand justification. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed The Sick Rose and Where My Books Go. I strongly encourage you to seek out more poems by both Yeats and Blake, and I look forward to our next lesson together. Thank you.